I'm feeling very proud and multidisciplinary today. I rushed over from, uh, I'm r rounding and running the stroke unit in the neuro ICU over at the medical campus. Um, and it's a bit of a change of pace, but uh, I'll manage. Um, so uh, I'm also really glad to be here, because I know why I'm really here, is that we wrote David Popple, who was a speaker after me. He and I um, plotted together about four years ago at a Gordon conference to write an article that came out exactly a year ago um, in Neuron, where we made a levels of explanation argument. And I, I don't know about David, but uh, we weren't expecting the, the firestorm that this article actually caused. Um, and uh, we only saw, of course, most of the time the positive responses. Uh, we were trolled, I'm sure, but we didn't get to see all of that. Um, and Barbara, I think, uh, enjoyed that article, and I think it was part of the inspiration for the talks we're giving today. Um, and we do study motor skill and motor learning, so I have been funded by the Science of Learning Institute as well. Um, and I will use it as an example for the point that David and I tried to make. And, you know, there is a concern. Um, yes, there are many, many levels of explanation, but we have argued in that piece and together that uh, there is a kind of dominant reductionist bias in the study of the brain right now, and largely due to a kind of truly exciting increase in the tools available to us, but the tools, I think, are now wagging the conceptual dog, um, and we need to take a step back. Um, and that's what I'll talk about a little bit. And through my own mistakes, uh, the example we've done in motor learning about how one can go astray and how one has to be more careful. Okay, so um, just to sort of make a plug for motor skill and motor learning, I'm sure everyone knows who that is up on the left, right? So please don't pretend you don't. I mean, someone call out his name, please. Okay, good. Who's that? <laughs> Excellent. So that's Andrew Wiles, who sold Fermat's last theorem. Right? So isn't it interesting? And I actually, true story, got to play tennis with him when my brother was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. And I remember we were going to play doubles in this rather frail looking guy in whites and an almost a, I think it was a wooden racket, maybe I'm making that up. Um, wanted to be my doubles partner. I said, I'm not going to play with him, we'll lose. Uh, and David said, shut up, he sold Fermat's last theorem. Right? <laughs> Anyway, it's interesting, is it not, that you knew who the basketball player was, but you didn't know who, uh, arguably, the equivalent is in the intellectual space. So we, as a, as a human species, are obsessed with motor skill. Right? A billion people watched the last World Cup final. 30 billion cumulatively watched the whole thing. But despite this overwhelming bias, we also have a kind of opposite bias, which is we kind of think that um, it's not the same to be good at sport as it is to be good at math, or good at music, or good at science. Right? So we're kind of conflicted between worshipping the motor system and motor skill and learning, and also thinking that there's something dumb jockey about it, which I'll talk about. Now, this is the piece uh, that David and I wrote with our colleagues, Asif and Alex and Malcolm. Uh, and this is the one that uh, I think sort of generated the debate. So, um, this is from Carl Crave, who's a philosopher uh, at the University of Washington in St. Louis. And he wrote a book um, about uh, brain philosophy of understanding the brain, actually. And the way to think about this, and I hope I get the pointer here, is, yeah. Is here, the, here you've got the um, mechanism in its totality at the top level at S, and here it is sighing. It's whatever it is you're trying to explain behaviorally. And then at the lower level, you have the components X, and each of their activities phi, and it's the interactions of the X's phiing that is the decomposed explanation for the total behavior S that is sighing. Okay? Now, if you were to ask somebody, let's say that this was cooking, and you wanted to understand why somebody is a good cook, you might say, well, they're good at reading recipes, they're good at salting, right? they're good at stirring. And that's really important because the explanatory level that you're using to explain why they're good at cooking or sighing is at the same level 
as a phenomenon itself. It's not likely that you're going to talk about that chef's working memory capacity, okay, or their selective spatial attention. You will be explaining here. Now, functionalism in the philosophy of science will suggest that there are emergent properties and, and, and means of explaining that exist at the higher level, and you don't have to go down to a lower one. And you, even neuroscientists who believe that the fundamental level that needs to be explained are neurons or networks themselves won't say they have to be particle physicists or chemists, because if they're going to argue down and the turtles go all the way down, we could say, well, if you think neurons are the fundamental unit, study atomic particles. And they don't have an argument, actually, to fight that. There's just this intuition that at the particular science that you've chosen, there's a fundamental level that stops and the turtles don't go all the way down. Now, the problem that I've had, and I think David and others have had, is that this kind of discussion doesn't get had in university departments because they're siloed. And you can get into trouble with the reductionist view, and you need what you really need, and the argument we made is you want a functionalist view with a causal mechanistic, causal mechanistic backup. All right. Oops. What did I do? Okay, so here's an example, and I know that Jim Kneerum's in the audience. So here are levels, right? So for example, here you've got a mouse in a water maze. You can look at it behaviorally. You can actually look at its hippocampus. You can actually look at the synaptic organization inside the hippocampus. We've blown up here. And then you can talk about ion channels. Now, you can work on ion channels. You can work on synaptic plasticity. You can do network models of the hippocampus. Or you can just study the animal in its maze. But the idea that you can just forego all these three levels and just talk about ion channels, which was basically in the 1940s was called the covering law, that there were fundamental laws at the lowest level which could explain away the upper levels, has, to be fair, I think, fallen by the wayside. Most people don't have that physical law view of how to explain behavior. But there is this view that somehow you can work maybe at these two levels from the bottom up, and it's actually going to tell us something more insightful about understanding the behavior than actually explain, uh, studying the behavior itself. And the point I would like to make is I think that is wrong. So in our paper, um, this is not a new kind of argument. I mean, this is a sort of a revividus version of it. But David Marr, famously in his book Vision in 1982, um, talked about levels of explanation. There was a computational explanation. You know, what is the system trying to solve in the world? The algorithm, in other words, what are the system, what is the recipe, what is the menu of steps that you need to go through in order to solve that computational problem? And then there was the implementational level. How do you actually instantiate it in neural tissue? And the example he gave is this one. Here's the problem you have to solve. You have to fly. Here's the algorithmic solution. You have to flap your wings. And here's the implementation, feathers. Okay. Now, famously, he had this to say. Trying to understand perception by studying neurons is like trying to understand flight by only studying feathers. It cannot be done. Okay. Now, this is an extreme view, in a way. And he was a neuroscientist who very much in the initial, initially did think that you could do it that way. Okay, now, we're not making the claim, as you'll see, that you can be purely, as the philosophers say, functionalist. Okay, but there is a bias when it comes to the study of behavior in neuroscience that feathers are what we should be looking at most. And then what the people who study feathers will say is we always do a little bit of behavior, right? To get the feathers going, right? So don't be mean. We do feathers and behavior. You just do flying. Right? But no, I don't buy it. OK, I'll give an example of that. So let's get back to this. So let's imagine how you're going to do science at all these levels, right? You can look at ion channels, you can look at 
neurons, you can look at circuits, and you can look at behavior. And you can throw your tools at these levels. All right? So let's give an example of a good friend of mine, Conrad Kerding, uh, and his colleague did neuroscience on a microprocessor. So this paper, which also caused a firestorm, that I got to see quite a lot during its proof stages, came out before ours. And we talked about it in our paper. And it's extremely interesting, because you need to look at these levels in the, from the, the behavior to the ion channels in the case of the hippocampus and spatial navigation. And now imagine the equivalent with a microprocessor. So here's the idea. Could a neuroscientist understand a microprocessor? Now, see again, just like we saw there, that you've got the behavior, which is playing three games, one of which was Donkey Kong and two others. Right? So this is an old microprocessor in a video game. Here it is. And then you have the decomposition, just like I showed you, all the way from the transistors, to the transistors being collected together to make certain kinds of logical gates. Here are the logical gate primitives. And then you can add the gates into, for example, something that does adding. And then this is what's making up the overall microprocessor. All right, so very similar to going all the way down to the ion channel rather than the transistor that we saw there in the spatial map. Now, the idea was, let's do neuroscience. Let's knock transistors out. Let's record. Let's look at connectivity. Let's throw the whole, the kitchen sink of modern neuroscience. And what is the goal? The goal is to reproduce this fetch, decode, execute algorithmic architecture of the microprocessor that any engineering student here at Hopkins or anyone else would verbalize to you if you asked them how a microprocessor works in the setting of this video game. All right. So what you're trying to do is to understand the microprocessor. Here's David Marr, basically level two, algorithmic description of it. And can you get that back by doing neuroscience on neurons and networks on it? No. It was a total failure. All right. They did everything. Right? Now, there have been meetings across departments that I've actually been in of irate neuroscientists, right? You know, just saying, so here's what they said. I shouldn't. So we want to see what kind of understanding would emerge from using a broad range of currently popular data analysis methods. And here's it in bold. The analysis can, cannot produce the hierarchical understanding of information processing that most students of electrical engineering obtain. Okay? Now, David Ma and others would not have been remotely surprised by this result. Okay? The fact that one had to go to this trouble to rediscover the point is a bit depressing, but nevertheless, it's delicious as well. Right? So what happens as a substitute for that failure? Right? Because it's not as though the facts that are extracted by the neuroscientific techniques are not true. It's not even true that they're not interesting. The question is, is what are they explaining? Okay. What they are doing is making causal necessity and sufficiency claims, that if you knock out this part of the microprocessor, if you lose this kind of connectivity, you lose this, you lose that. But that set of necessity and sufficiency claims cannot be constructed into that algorithmic flow diagram. So what I argue, and David and the rest of us argued in the paper, was that there's a kind of psychological panic that this is induces, that one has to escape from. And how does one do that? Well, one does this. One does the science, which is perfectly fine, right? You do a manipulation, you manipulate a circuit to intervene on a behavior, and then you make necessity and sufficiency arguments. And then after you've done this kind of analysis, you make sentences of the claim of, you know, the circuit is the cause of the behavior. And then you go one step further and you say the circuit plus some filler verb, you can take your pick here, right? They're all, they're all over the literature, modulates, shapes, mediates, ensures, enables, plus that. No extra conceptual work of any kind has actually been done, right? But it's so not satisfying to have just made these necessity and sufficiency claims 
that all this verbiage just generates itself across all the papers, the field, because there's this lack, there's this little whimpering lack that we haven't actually explained the way that the engineer could explain the algorithmic circuit. And these are called filler terms. Right. Now let me give you an example. Um, so Carl Dizeroff, who discovered optogenetics, who I was lucky enough to open a conference with in Germany late last year, to dinner, and I told him I was going to give him a diff, um, uh, does this kind of work, right? Optogenetics allows, and it literally in the review article that he recently wrote, you know, very beautifully well-written uh, article explaining how optogenetics can do beautiful work on necessity and sufficiency claims. But this is what you get, though. Understanding the neural mechanisms that mediate, there's a filler term, Social reward has important societal and clinical implications. Hung Lao found that the release of the neuropeptide increased pro-social behaviors, and then oxytocin release influenced social behavior. There's another filler term. Right? So in other words, this is all true from a causal sense, but why oxytocin should make you more sociable isn't answered. Right? You could put anything in there. You take your molecule of choice. You would have the same response to the sentence. So motor learning. So here's the classic experiment, behavioral experiment, by Brenda Milner, um, who was in her 90s. And this was a patient, HM, who had intractable epilepsy. And in an attempt to control his epilepsy, he had a bilateral temporal lobectomy and um, had the hippocampus and other structures removed and developed a profound um, antrograde plus some retrograde amnesia. And in a landmark experiment, so this is a patient, if you met HM, he would, you would introduce yourself, you'd say hello, and then the same thing would happen the next day, and you'd have that no familiarity, no sense of who you were. You'd have to go through the whole introduction again. So what Brenda Milder did was this incredible experiment where she made HM mirror draw. So basically, you see your hands through a mirror, vision of your arm is obscured, you have to trace the double perimeter of a star, and the quality of your performance is how long you can stay within the star, and you can do something called a root mean square error to calculate that. And amazingly, HM got better across days, but each time um, he was asked to do the task, he didn't even have familiarity, didn't know what he was being asked to do. In other words, there was this incredible dissociation between a declarative, explicit awareness of what was needed, and yet was better at the task, even yeah. though did not know had done it on the previous day. Okay? So this was, you could argue, was one of the launches of the multiple me memory systems view of cognitive neuroscience. Now, in the lab, you can not do mirrors and pencils and things like that. You can do it on the computer. And, you know, we and others have spent a lot of time studying essentially the sister computer task for that original mirror drawing task. Now, it turns out, with an irony, which I don't have time to go into today, that the mirror drawing task is in some ways more than this, but that doesn't matter to the argument I'm going to make now. So you can basically have people um, reach with a mouse, for example, or with a detector towards a target on a screen. And you can basically dissociate the, what their hand is doing with the cursor and, the, and where the cursor actually goes. So you see this systematic error. It's a little bit like mirror drawing. And then you get better over time. Implicitly is the argument you don't realize that your hand is now going off to the left and the cursor is now going into the target. You've adapted. Um, this happens incrementally, trial by trial. All, many, many animals can do this. You can then fit uh, a function to this. Um, you can have parameters that fit that function, and those parameters can be given meaning. So, for example, you can have a, um, a learning rate, and you can have a retention factor, and then you can sort of inscribe biological meaning to these parameters that you fit to the function, and then you can do imaging, and you can put in the design matrix of your imaging, the parameters on the fits, for example, um, and you can start looking for the neural basis of this behavior. Now, and this kind of learning in the paper that we published way back now is actually very implicit. In other words, when you first aim with your hand to a target, you go where it's expected. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is the classic thing that I just told you. Your hand goes there, the cursor goes there, and then over time, you now aim your hand over here. We don't even realize it, and the cursor goes to the target, and there's a learning curve. Your baseline behavior is the learning curve. Interestingly, if you ask people to be cognitive about it, 
In other words, you say, don't bother with this old reptilian system, just aim directly to this target in the first trial and get rid of all this incremental learning. Sure enough, you can do that. So in other words, here are your first two errors. You're then instructed to cheat, and blam, in one trial, you're down to zero error. But then something very spooky happens. Despite your cheating strategy, you get worse and worse and worse over time. It's very disturbing. Right? So why is it that you're trying to hit the target and you're getting worse and worse, even though you're applying the same strategy that worked in the first trial? But all of you should see, and this is why we've plotted it this way, that that learning curve that I called implicit looks very much like this learning curve that's getting into trouble after the initial um, application of the strategy. Now, what this turns out to be about is that the, despite the fact that you want to hit the target, you aimed the cursor somewhere else, and there's a part of your brain that wants the cursor to go where you aimed it and sees the error as a, as a mistake and tries to correct that prediction error where you aimed, despite that overriding your more strategic desire for the cursor to go into the target. You don't care where your hand is aiming. There's a very implicit sensory prediction error-based system. It overrides. Uh, the, so in a, in a kind of way, it's got an analogy to HM. There's a system that has remained and a system that has gone. And you, know, you can do experiments to show that patients, it's what we call in neurology paradoxical brain, can do some things after brain injury better than we can without brain injury. And sure enough, this is true, that patients with cerebellar lesions can in fact cheat better than we can on this task, and they don't show that implicit drift. Why? Because that part of the brain that we think is responsible for sensory prediction error learning has been damaged. Right. And I did exactly what I just criticized. You fit a function, you look at the parameters of that function in brain imaging, and you go, oh look, these are the brain regions involved, fill a term, uh, with this task. All right. So all looks good. HM, the adaptation task, the pure implicit system, there's the cerebellum and other areas of the brain. All is good. And it's so good that you end up with a mathematical framework. And it's interesting that our provost talked about Kalman filtering and Bayes rules. Well, sure enough, you can apply a Kalman filter um, model to this kind of learning. We've done that too. And then you can come up with a, 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 a diagram, a, 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 a level one and level two diagram of what's going on. Right? I don't have to go into this in detail. And then you can give it an anatomical framework. Cerebellum here, the Ford model doing the predictions, the control policy coming out of motor cortex. It looks great. Consilience. Mathematical model that makes sense. The parts of the brain that respond to those computations and the behavior. Right? Not so fast. Here's the problem. Is that if you, and I, got, I was lucky, I got to speak to Brenda Milner about this experiment, is what actually happened that day or those days? Right? In other words, when the patient came in and you had to go, OK, this is a mirror, this is a pencil, this is what you need to do. Those are very verbal instructions. Right? And then the next day, presumably, you had to go, this is a mirror, this is a pencil, this is what you have to do. Right? So, just because HM couldn't remember using explicit verbal instructions across days doesn't mean that he didn't have to use the explicit verbal instructions on each day. So one of the big mistakes about this experiment is people think because you can't remember what you did, it doesn't mean that everything that you did was implicit on the day that you did it. I hope you can follow that. Right? And when you, I talked to Brenda Milner about this. She said, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I don't, we didn't quite record how much instruction we had to give per day. Right? But clearly, I just want you to know that there's a very explicit component there all along. Right? And then we wrote, so Jason Stanley and I, a philosopher at Yale now, wrote this article about motor skill, and it, and it was based on this article where we provoked people who thought that HM proved that motor learning was largely implicit because HM could do it. My motor skill depends on knowledge of facts. And actually, Barbara and others have done some really interesting work, I think, which kind of supports the view that we took here. Um, and then we wrote this article, Is the Dumb Jock Really a Nerd? Right? 
Because, you know, I was actually asked two years ago by Time magazine, they were writing an article about LeBron James, and they were very worried. They kept saying, Dr. Cracker, can we call LeBron James a genius? Because he's really, is it just his muscles or his big body? Right, and I said, of course you can call him uh, a genius. And this is the argument we made in these two articles, based on the fact that there was a highly cognitive component hiding all along in that HM experiment, which had been taken as a launch for the idea that there are some things like motor skill that are implicit, and you shouldn't give them any cognitive credit. And it turns out that it's true, because of this experiment by Roy and Park, these are doodads that you don't recognize. They're strange um, objects that you have to be instructed how to learn, and you have to remember how to use them to know how to interact with them motorically. And it turns out that patients like HM can never learn how to use these tools, okay, which is exactly what you'd expect if real motor skills were a combination of the explicit and the implicit, and the explicit have to be remembered as well. And sure enough, as soon as you get to complex things, HM. And it's, but nevertheless, I think that because HM could mirror draw, HM could have learned how to play tennis. Right? Complete nonsense. So the point here being that even motor tasks, despite what neuroscience seems to be telling us, are actually a combination of both. And then that leads to a paradox. Because if you now do the kind of tasks that we use in the lab to study learning across days, and I'm not going to go into all the details in the interest of time, but it turns out that even these simple tasks are made up of a combination of deliberate explicit aiming and this automatic implicit system that I told you about before. And the two of these systems add up together to give you the net learning. Okay. And you can look at the, um, the paper if you want to know more of the details. But basically, the discovery was that you have a cooperation between explicit and implicit processes, even in simple tasks that look very much like the mirror task that HM did. All right. So just so you follow the argument, all these tasks have an explicit bit and an implicit bit. You can remember something across days, presumably in HM because he'd lost declarative memory he couldn't remember the explicit thing he did on each day the next day, so the only thing that could have transferred across days must have been the implicit bit. And that implicit bit is the one that's been propagated down to us as being the main driver of motor skill and motor learning. Right. But what I'm going to tell you is that when you study memory across days in these tasks that are like that mirror task, and again, I'm going to just give you the punchline because of time. This is done by David Hubbardu, who did his PhD with us and is now a uh, postdoc at Yale, and Adrian Hayes is um, co-director of the lab, and they're actually looking at data that I'm about to show you. Um, and I'm, again, I'm going to skip the details. I'm going to give you the punchline, is that you can actually take these tasks and you can dissect the explicit and implicit by limiting the amount of time people have to think about it. You can control their reaction times. So the reaction time can become the um, independent variable. So you can actually play around with how much learning can you do when you're not allowed to think about it explicitly, and how much learning can you do when you have to. And the fascinating implication of this experiment was that Adrian and David found that the implicit system, the system that ostensibly has to be surviving across days in HM, doesn't have any memory. Right? The system that ended up remembering across days in the healthy subjects was the explicit system. See the difference between this gray line and the red line? Okay. So you should immediately, if you're still following, there's a problem. Because we're claiming that HM was remembering across days because of the intactness of an implicit system that we can study in the lab. And yet, that very same system has no memory when you study across days. So then you should all be asking yourselves, what on earth did HM not forget? Right. Now, it turns out, and again, I'll give you the punchline, that it seems as though the explicit strategies that you employ can slowly automatize themselves and themselves become implicit. Okay? So it wasn't the implicit system that was there all along with its own memory. It was these explicit things you were doing that with practice, even across days, were beginning to automatize and take on the characteristics of the implicit. 
And that's just also in this paper here, this uh, diagram here. And basically, it's just showing you, and this is complicated, but what I'm going to say is that green line that hasn't budged from here to here is your implicit system, and that blue line that's gone up is your explicit one that has become implicit. Now, why am I telling you all this? Right? Because you're wondering, but why is he going through all this sophisticated behavioral analysis? That's what I want you to be going. Why is he going on? Why couldn't he have just pointed at some brain regions and be done with it? We preferred his old version. Right? Well, because what happens is that unless you do extremely careful, and may I say clever, behavioral dissection first, you're going to be led completely astray when you start looking at your neural data, like I was. Right? Because in fact, the whole brain went in on it. You can't say, hey, look, shut up, everyone over here. Cerebellum, do your thing. Right? It doesn't work that way, because there's presumably a cost function that we don't know about where all the regions make differential weighted contributions to what's going on. So to finish, just want to say that paradoxically, if what I'm saying is true, then we're going to learn more about motor skill and motor learning by studying chess and math than we are the simple tasks that we do in the lab. Because these all of these take 10 years to be good at. All these take an hour or so. So wouldn't it be ironic if, after what I just told you, that the system that ends up making HM good across days was the declarative system all along, right? It was cognitive from the get-go. And whatever process requires cognitive modules to be automatized, and the more complex the task, the more you have to learn to automatize. And you may need to automatize module by module, your backhand, your forehand, your serve, your strategies, imagine, that's going to take you a long, long time, right? And that, in fact, there is no difference between learning how to play chess and learning how to play tennis, right? And what happened is that the HM story and those simple lab tasks led us astray, and then we started looking at their neural basis, but it's very questionable to me whether their neural basis is going to tell us about the neural basis of the things that we ostensibly care about in the psychological world. Um, so what I showed you, this is a figure again, and here's the big bias that I'm complaining about with David. And basically the argument is you need to have a theory first, then you need to do behavioral experiments to test algorithms, then you can get constraints and confirmations from the neural level, and then that might refine your level understanding when it comes to one and two. And I, I'm, my brother is the president of the Santa Fe Institute which is where complexity is studied. And he and I have been wondering whether there's some kind of trade-off between the complexity of the system and the level of granularity where you need to say, can you understand it? And I wonder whether when it comes that psychologists kind of got it right by accident that psychological variables are the right level of granularity to understand complex phenomena. And when it comes to simple tasks, like eye movements or stretch reflex, the granularity can be lower down towards Ma level three, because it's simpler and you can actually understand algorithmically at that lower level. There's isomorphism between the granularity at the level of, of the implementational level and the understanding. But once you start getting more complicated, you go upwards. And what David has told me, and he must be right because he's the president of the complexity place, um, is that there's always a level of coarse graining where you can begin to have that aha feeling of algorithmic understanding. But that level of coarse graining is probably going to go up as the behavior you're trying to uh, explain gets more complex. Which means, if it's true, that any attempt to explain a behavior beyond causality by going into neurons and networks is doomed. All right. Thanks very much. OK. I'm happy to answer questions. Well, anybody in Fury is a failure. <laughs>
So uh, you started off saying there's a bias of b bottom up um, uh, levels of, of yes. explanation. Mm -hmm. Um, and you ended with this, um, and maybe the second step helps too, but I'm wondering about uh, situations, at, at least some situations, uh, where the second step is absolutely necessary, where the top down can go astray and you're not actually, um, the, the psychological variables um, that you're trying to explain can't exist based on what we know about the implementation. So, so that, right. So I, I, I'm not being a, as purely functionalist as some people are in the philosophy field that David Ma seemed to be when he said there was no point studying feathers, right? I absolutely, in that diagram, believe that you want to refine, constrain, update your computational and algorithmic theories. And don't be very clear, all I'm arguing is that behavioral work is the best way to test computational and algorithmic theories. Right? Implementation level work is usually causal necessity sufficiency claims. That doesn't mean that one can't, once you come up with your behaviorally inspired computational and algorithmic theories, then refine, update, correct by going into the brain itself. In the paper, we have a great um, section that, that David wrote about sound localization. Right, you know, the computational problem is to which way, where's the sound coming from, then there are different potential algorithms that can be used, temporal or spatial, and then you go into the brain to break the tie in terms of how it's actually done. So we're not, but what, what I'm saying is if you look at, the, at a journal like Nature Neuroscience or Neuron, they're just totally saturated with circuit cracking work, right? where, like the example I gave, where they basically just record and play and they just throw their methodological toolkit and you're supposed to go, what a tour de force of technique. And in the end, it's just sentences with filler terms. Right? I don't mind the causality claim. The causality, I, I, my other work is, depends on causality for recovery after brain injury. Right? But what I can't stand right, is this philosophical sophistry where after all that work, at the end, you go, is that it? That's your conclusion, that pathetic little sentence, which is basically a restatement of the result? Is that how conceptually empty the work is going to be? Like, that's what's annoying, right? But, so, and all I'm saying is that you can enrich it by doing better behavioral work. And, and what I don't buy is the idea was we get that now. So at Genelia and other places, we've got amazing behavioral paradigms and we're doing the circuit simultaneously. Right? But I just don't think, with few exceptions, you can do it simultaneously. Right? But you're forced to because you can't get published right? unless you have a, a bit of meat that's been involved. A neuron's been touched somehow. And all I'm saying, I'm not against that work. I mean, I'm collaborating with people at Genelia. Right? I like that kind of work. What I can't stand is that scientists themselves seem to be so conceptually anemic about what it is. Murray Del Man famously said once about British people, you know, they're very, very, very clever, but they're not very intelligent. Right? <laughs> right? And I think what we're having is a huge tidal wave of cleverness and technique and engineering, right, which is all great, but the thoughtfulness is atrophying like the appendix. And I don't know why. What else? Yes. So I just wanted, to, if you could clarify, maybe this will be something for the general discussion later on, but uh, so you were preaching to the choir boy here for the first three quarters of your talk. <laughs> and then I started wondering where you were going at, at the latest. And, and the last statement you just made very strongly, right on. But I'm, I'm, I'm confused though about what you are, wh what you think about ultimately the, the ability for us to understand these complex behaviors, complex feats of cognition at the level of neural circuitry or not. Whether it's just too levels that are so removed we'll never understand one in terms of the other, or whether it's just the order which and, and the strategies at which to get to that understanding. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, exactly, they're both separate. So one is absolutely the order and the strategy, right? 
Um, the other one is absolutely there are wonderful examples where they come together beautifully, like David Robinson here at Johns Hopkins, where he basically showed beautiful isomorphism between his computational theory, the neural circuitry of the ocular motor circuit, and saccades. Right? David Robinson himself wondered whether that beautiful click-like fit was going to work all the way up. Okay. Understanding and explanation are not the same thing, right? You can say, I've understood something, when really you haven't, right? So when is an understanding erroneous, and then explanation is there to correct your understanding? Now, what I would say is, it may well be that the psychology of humans is such that you need a level of granularity that may go up from the circuit to say, I've understood something. No. What I worry about is that it may not be possible to have the David Robinson satisfactory feeling of understanding across levels once the circuitry and the behaviors become more complex. So in other words, I might be able to say to you in a few sentences, how does the ocular motor system make saccades? But if you said to me, John, tell me in a few sentences how an ant colony works, I'd have a hard time. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't levels of description of ant colonies and bee colonies that, that I can transmit. It's just that it won't be about individual ants and individual bees. So I'm suspicious that we may not get the, can we understand a behavior by a circuit, that you will go, aha, yes. Right? You, you'll never have that satisfaction. But we will be able to tell you things and facts that are necessary for that behavior to happen. That's my worry, that we may just be in, there's only a piece of the parameter space of understanding where that Robinsonian click occurs. And everywhere else, maybe we can only do causality work at the low level and higher-grained explanatory work with psychological variables. Do you see what I'm saying? That's my concern. But I don't know if that's true. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, yes. Right, one more. Thank you. Um, you said that psychology has the right granularity of conceptualizations. Or I said it might. I'll just. It might. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was my. It was a provocation for the neuroscientists. To, to get it. Um, for example, psychologists often argue about specific concepts of constructs, like for example, in work, working memory, or there are tons of discussions. So when they have it right, why would they disagree? Or why would they? Why would they disagree? Or there can be concepts or theories that might just be purely wrong. How does that fit to your yes um, your theory? Um, so what people that's a great question because this is where some people will say that you need level three to go from what the philosophers call how possibly models to how actually modeled. So in other words, you could argue that when Hodgkin and Huxley came up with their equation to explain how the action potential propagated, that your aha moment was already satisfied, but it mattered which did it, it matters that sodium and potassium involved. You might say, I wouldn't care if it were two other atoms entirely. It'd still be the same math. Right? So I, I, I would say that of course we're always going to agree, because there's always redundancy in the fits of our models, right? There, you know, there are mathematical models that will fit, but you could have another model that's slightly tweaked that would fit better, and then you have that model comparison problem, right? And some people like to do model comparison. I think that's what's going on in arguments, a kind of fuzzy model comparison. Or you do a killer experiment so the psychologists disprove each other. Right? So it, 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 it's complicated, but I'm not sure that the answer always is going to be resolved by going down to the neural level. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>